YouTube and welcome to a new video. This is going to be my review of 2021, taking the form of my top 10 reads of the year. Now I know it's only December the 12th and it seems like I've got a bit early, uh, but I feel I could draw a line under my reading for this year because I've only got one more book I anticipate finishing between now and the 31st of December and that is James Joyce's Ulysses because I go on uh, Christmas holidays uh, from this coming Wednesday and uh, the aim is to use all that time for writing. I'm not anticipating really anything else. Uh, it just may happen that the writing doesn't go so well and I pick up books to read instead. I hope that doesn't happen, but if it does, I will just include them in the review for next year. So on to my reading statistics. I read 112 books, including Joyce, this year. Uh, 100 of which were fiction and 12 were non-fiction. And most of what I'm going on to uh, say relates to fiction. My top 10 books are only fiction books. Um, so, th you know, the mass is very easy that it's 100 books. So of those 100 fiction titles, 14 were poetry, one was a graphic novel, five were short stories. And of the 112 books, three were rereads for me, including two non-fiction and one fiction. So on to the analysis of the fiction breakdown of the 100 books. Um, 17 were written by authors of colour or First Nation. Uh, 10 were LGBTQ+, of which three were by trans uh, writers, all of whom were trans women. I have yet to uh, sort of come across a book by a trans man, so if you've can recommend any good fiction by a trans man, I'd be very grateful. Um, in terms of gender, 64 were written by men, 36 were, 36 were written by women. Geographically, uh, 35 were from the UK, 22 were from the US, uh, 21 from the EU, of which three were from Ireland, and 22 were from the rest of the world, and one I could not place. I don't know where he was from. And of the rest of the world, 22, three were Jamaica. Uh, they were all by uh, the same poet. Seven were from Canada. Two were from Australia. Two were from Brazil. Three were from Chile. One from Mexico. One from Japan. One from Algeria. And one from South Africa. So um, that's all the stats other than my Goodreads star rating. So again, I'm only going to talk about the 100 fiction books. I gave 34 five stars. I gave 46 four stars, I gave 16 three stars, and four two stars. So the first thing to say from that is what a fantastic reading year it's been. I would say probably this has been my best reading year ever in terms of the quality of books I've read. Uh, but it does mean that of the 34 five star books, I have to somehow narrow that down to 10 for my top 10. So there's lots of uh, honourable uh, mentions that I could have made but just didn't make the, the final cut but as I say that's 24 five star reads that I'm not even going to talk about today. Um, the next thing to say is my ratings being what they are all 10 of these books I absolutely love but they're not perfect. My five star rating does not equal perfection, never has. Um, but these were the, the books that, that exploded my mind the, the, the most, I suppose. But I can't put them in an order of 1 to 10 because they're all so different. So when I talk about them, I'm going to sort of give the sort of top line of, of why I liked it so much. Obviously, uh, they all, I will put in the uh, description box below uh, links to the sort of fuller uh, reviews of each of these books. Uh, if you want to take that up. And just to say, of the top ten that I've culled, five were written by men and five were written by women. OK, on to the books. So, uh, the one with the nightmare title, Important Artifacts and Personal Property from the Collection of Leonora Doolan and Harold Morris, including books, street fashion and jewellery, by uh, Canadian writer Leanne Shapton. So uh, I was very lucky uh, that uh, I hadn't heard of this book, but Zena over at um, Beating About the Books uh, asked me if I'd read it. I said no. We did a buddy read of it. First thing to say is it's a very quick read because it's mainly in pictures. Uh, this is the most radical book I think I've read in terms of sort of style and, and, and sort of formalism because it's presented as if it's... Um, uh, an, um, an auction uh, catalogue 
of lots of items, as it says, of this putative couple, Lea, uh, Leonora Doolan and Harold Morris, who live in New York, both fairly successful in their own fields. And it traces the, 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 the rise and fall of their relationship through the objects that we are asked to bid on in this national auction. And each of the objects has a little narrative uh, just to explain it, as you would get in an auction ca catalogue. The brilliance of this book is just how much you can learn and read into the lives of these characters through their, ob their everyday household objects and knickknacks and possessions and, and choice of books and records and clothes. It's, it's so brilliantly done. Uh, so you, you, you sort of learn about these two characters, but you also learn about the third thing, which is these two characters in relationship with each other. And the little aggressions in sort of gifts or notes or emails that are never sent, but are just venting. It's, it's superb. It's, it's so coherent as a, as a piece. That's why I describe it as radical, because there are plenty of books that use, you know, a few pictures here and there. Uh, Sabal does it, for example. But this whole book is constructed of pictures. Just wonderful. Next, The Octopus Man by Jap Jasper Gibson, who's not an author I'd ever heard of before, or read, obviously. Uh, I saw Eric Carl Anderson haul this. It's a book about schizophrenia, which is something I'm always very interested in reading about and have read a lot about, both fiction and non-fiction, and always come away unsatisfied by those books because the problem... It doesn't matter if it's fiction or non-fiction. The problem is they're too literary. So that when you talk about maybe audio or visual hallucinations of the schizophrenic, they tend to get, you know, rather sort of lyrical, you know, metaphor. They're, you know, they're, they're real images to the schizophrenic. And in the book, they are not this book, in the other books, they are treated as metaphors. You know, they're given a literary treatment, which I've always found a bit unsatisfying. This book is what I take to be the best representation of someone with schizophrenia. And yes, it's a novel, so he is using artifice and fiction, fictional techniques. But I didn't feel that it was artificial. I didn't feel that it was, you know, over-literary at all. Um, it's, a, it's a brilliant portrayal. And in the back of the book, in the afterword, he does say that it's dedicated and based on one of his very good friends who was a schizophrenic and who died in their 40s and stuff. But, you know, an absolutely superb portrayal of someone with schizophrenia. Georges Perec, 53 Days. So this was Georges Perec's final book, and it's presented as, it in, as if he died before he finished it. So part one is a guy reading a manuscript that has come to him of a, of a sort of detective thriller. Uh, he's asked to read it over. And it's a fairly standard... Um, sort of detective manuscript set in one of the French colonies. It's not specified which one. Then part two is a whole different sort of thing, which is un unfinished, which is about uh, an incident during the Second World War amongst the French resistance and whether a group of them uh, were betrayed by, by a sort of a Nazi uh, mole inside, inside the organisation. And it's made clear that the part one manuscript is a way of encoding this actual supposed, I, mean, I don't know if this is true or not, this French resistance thing, if it ever happened, um, but that part one was a fictional encoding of part two, because part two is such a sort of explosive issue and, and you know. And then part three is the supposed unfinished notes, which was going to help finish part two. But I think the genius of this book is not at all, you know, it's putatively uh, put together after Perek's death by two other members of um, the Olipo group, of which Henry Matthews is one, I can't remember the other one, um, Jacques Rubard, um, that they, they brought together these notes and, and sort of tied it up and, and, and put it together, at, you know, as best they could. Uh, but I don't think so. I think Perek has done all of that and they're, because they're all members of the same movement, I think they were in, they agreed to be used in such a way. I think it's a brilliant way of Perek going, Yabu sucks to death. He knew he was dying. He had, I think, lung cancer. And he was basically sort of saying, I'm going to finish this book come hell or high water before I die, uh, but make it look as though I was cheated by death. And, and I think that's what this book does so well. It's, it's genius. And it was translated by David Bellos. And on to Leanne Bettison-Marsake Simpson, Canadian First Nation, 
this is Nupaming. And what I love about this book is it's just so refreshing. It's so different to any, any sort of Western tradition of fiction. And that just, you know, it just, as I say, it's just so refreshing. I'm not sure I got everything, you know, that it was in it. Uh, the chapters are very short, sometimes only one line. The characters have several sort of uh, different personas, both a sort of spiritual and an animal, as well as the real life person. Um, but I loved it. I loved every minute of it. And this is very lyrical. Uh, just a wonderful read. Uh, W.G. Sebald, Austerlitz, his last book. Uh, this is translated by uh, Anthea Bell, who I think was one of Kafka's uh, regular uh, translators. So this is the fourth and last Sebald uh, book. I've only read three. I shall read uh, Vertigo next year. And I think this is my favourite. I mean, they're all brilliant, uh, the, other, the, the three I've read. But I, I actually like this more because... I think it's more concretized, if you can ever use that word, about Sabald, who's very sort of, um, it's very hard to pin down Sabald's characters, you know, and what's true and what's fiction. It de he deliberately merges both. But this is the story about uh, a boy who leaves Prague at age six on the kinder transport that took Jewish children out of uh, Nazi occupied territory before the war broke out. Uh, he ends up in Wales, and the point is that he has no memories of his life in Prague. The, the, gradually, the book strips that back as he becomes acquainted with this whole other history, this whole other person he could have been had he have been allowed to, you know, grow up and develop in Prague as you know was the plan. Um, and it's, as I say, it's done with sort of uh, sort of pictures and photos, which you learn are all fake. I mean, obviously they're fake because this character, Jacques Auslitz, never existed. He's a fictional character, so these photos cannot be photos to do with him. But, so for example, this image on the cover is supposed to be Jacques Auslitz at about age four at a wedding, it's a page boy, and it turns out that, no, it's some random photo that, that Sable picked up uh, of a boy in Stockport in the northwest of England. This is what I mean about what Sable does so beautifully and so artfully. You know, this book should not work. It starts off with long uh, run-on paragraphs about sort of architecture of sort of, you know, 19th century fortresses and stuff. And then it will go into sort of etymological considerations. But it does work. <laughs> it's very hard to explain why. I, you know, of all my reviews, maybe you should go and check out one for this because... It's a lot more coherent than I'm being now, but I just love this book, as I love all of Sable's. And on to uh, David Diop, At Night All Blood is Black, a French Senegalese writer. This is translated by Anna Moshkovac Anna Moshkovakis. This won the International Booker Prize, and deservedly so. This is a book about a Senegalese battalion of the French army during the First World War. They're there for, they're very good soldiers, but they're also there as a sort of um, psychological weapon of these sort of supposed savages that go over the over the trenches into the German lines, are supposed to sort of sow panic in, in the German ranks. Uh, only one, you know, one of their, their number sees his best friend uh, bayoneted to death in front of him on the battlefield and has a bit of a breakdown and, th and thinks, OK, well, war is savage. They want us to be savages. I'm going to give them savagery. And he turns, so, uh, you know, he continues his sort of soldierly duties uh, under discipline during the day. But at night, he becomes uh, like a sort of serial killer and single-handedly crosses under the cover of darkness, crosses no man's land and takes a German victim each time and absolutely brutalises and mutilates them. So he, he becomes this savage that... That, that they all play at and they hope that the Germans will 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 believe and in fact he starts to create this. It's a it's a really interesting book. I've never seen a treatment of World War One which steps out of the parameters of just World War One, you know, warfare, which, you know, we know a lot about about barbed wire, shell shock, uh, mustard gas, trenches, trench foot, all this sort of stuff. This uses certain modern elements, but not anachronistically, you know, the notion of a, of a serial killer and stuff. 
it's very brutal it's it's just brilliantly done um it goes a bit off piece towards the end as he sort of even his own soldiers fear him and sort of kick him back to uh, medical establishments behind the line because they're worried about his sanity and and then we get a stuff behind the lines and his attitude towards women is a bit scary but there again his attitude towards humanity is scary so uh yeah david diop at night all blood is black uh, the next one is in my garage just because it's so big it is uh, lucy elman's ducks new report which uh, I finally managed to finish this year. I'd reached up to the page 300 before this year, so I read 700 pages of it to finish it. And, I, you know, I loved it when I was reading the 300 pages, but I had to put it down for whatever reason. I loved it even more, having finished it. And I know this is a book that divides opinion, but the reason I love it is because I reject and I'm uninterested in the classical depiction of character in fiction which tends to be uh, a protagonist who goes on a journey so that they are a different character by the end than they started be that a spiritual journey a journey of understanding a journey of knowledge a journey of self-understanding whatever it is human beings do not live their lives like that that's not to say some people can't turn their lives around or change them radically they of course they can but most of us don't what this book does, what Duck's New Report does, is opens up a view into how human beings really think. The fact that our, any, any sort of snapshot of thought is not single, unidirectional, devoted and focused on one thing. Our brains don't work like that. They're firing all sorts of different things off at the same time, which is reproduced brilliantly in this book from baking cakes that she does as a little side home industry, to fears about her children, to fears about America and Trump particularly, to local instances of flooding, to snatches of songs that come into her head, to recollections of her favourite films, which she watches with one of her daughters, all these sorts of stuff. And over a thousand pages, you think that would get quite repetitive. It doesn't. There's a lot of wordplay, which of course is right in my wheelhouse because I love wordplay and use it myself in my writing but I just think I can't say it's a perfect perfect book because it's a thousand pages long which makes a lot of assumptions on you as a reader that you're prepared to buy into that I was it was almost perfect to me I think as I say the only thing the reason it probably wasn't perfect is 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 its length which sounds bizarre uh, because in a way um you know, a book like that could go on for 10,000 pages or you could maybe boil it down to 200 pages. I don't know, but I loved it. And on to Nervous System by Lina Meruan, translated by Megan McDowell. This is a Chilean, Chilean writer uh, of Palestinian extraction. This book, I think, is uh, the best written book uh, in terms of its language, its metaphor, its lyricism which speaks to the, the job done by the translator Megan Mandel to, to come across the original Spanish into that. It's just fantastic. It's a very medical heavy book. It's about um, a woman who is supposedly doing her PhD, but she has all sorts of uh, sort of physical complaints and you know she goes to get them tracked down and they can never come to find what the cause is. Maybe it's psychosomatic. And then her boyfriend, who is a forensic uh, anthropologist, gets called to um, mass burial sites around the world where dictators have, have you know, killed people and buried them and hoped that they would never be found. And he, he's brought in as part of a team, you know, basically to restore history and justice for these, these dead people. And he has been attacked as it was a bomb at one of his sites so that he has got lots of shrapnel embedded in his face, including the shards of bones of these murdered people, which is just a chilling, chilling notion. Uh, all the way through to her, her father, who is a, a ur I think a kidney and urine, urinary specialist uh, physician, and he is dying because he's an old man and of, you know, conditions that, that he worked and had full knowledge of. So it's very medical, medically heavy. There's no real plot. We don't really revisit the psychosomatic thing because gradually the movement of the book is from maybe psychosomatic illness to, you know, incontrovertible physical decline and decay of her father uh, kind of thing. So just 
a brilliant, you know, there's not one line or word wasted in this book. The way it just paints with words is, is just superlative. Uh, the next book I don't have, it's in my shed, uh, and that is Clarice Lispector. Let me get the correct title of this. Uh, stupidly, I don't know who uh, translated it because I don't have the book on me. Uh, it's called An Apprenticeship or the Book of Pleasures. Which I think has only been recently translated into English for the first time. I love Clarice Lispector. I want to read all of her long fiction. I started off with Agua Viva, which was fantastic. Then I read The Passion According to G8, which is one of the most intense books I've ever read and was getting my all time top 20. And then there's been a bit of a drop off because those two books are so good that, that the rest of her oeuvre that I read couldn't ever quite live up to that. But what I'm pleased to say about this one is that it does. It's It has a slight difference of intensity. I mean, the thing about Clarice Lispector is she is an intense writer. And there are elements of intensity because all of her characters are always so inward looking in the interior rather than exterior. This is obviously still there, but it's a lot more accessible. It's the, 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 it's not as dense, which isn't to say that it's, not, it's sort of less profound. It isn't. It's still a profound treatise on a man and a woman who are having a relationship, but it's not being consummated because the man wants the woman to... Um, commune at the level of the soul once their souls are communing then then they will consummate it and it's a lot of reflections on that and stuff but it's it i can't think of a writer about the human con sort of interiority and in relations who's better than this spectre she's so good and she again you know she she absolutely nails it in this book and it was a huge pleasure that you know this book as I say, having read a few that were slightly sort of under the level of the first two of hers I read, this is bang straight back up to there. And finally, one of the first books I read, in fact, I think it was the second book I read, this is Rianne Hughes XX, a novel graphic, and it is a graphic novel, uh, science fiction. I hadn't heard of this because Ryan uh, Hughes is not an author, known as an author, he's known as a, a graphic designer. Uh, Eric Carl Anderson had uh, talked about this book and Eric was spot on. This is wonderful. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail about it, but there is a lot of visual stuff. Um, there's a lot of this stuff because there are unembodied uh, characters who only represent themselves by initially by um, sort of communing across the computer screen in those fonts, so different font for each of the three characters. Um, and it's about an alien invasion that has got sort of stuck in between our dimensionalities. So it's like, how are we going to do, you know, if, they, if it, they're ever able to penetrate into our dimension, they will wipe us out. So uh, <laughs> hilariously, uh, they're first discovered by a sort of uh, hipster tech firm, uh, graphic design firm in Hoxton in, in, in London, which is near where, where my old office was. Uh, and and it beautifully nails that hipster <laughs> lifestyle. But so there's a lot in this book. Uh, it has an homage to 50 sci-fi series, uh, comic series and stuff. And it's just brilliant, brilliantly done. And I love the visuals of this book. So there you have it. That was my top 10 reads of the year in what was a, an astoundingly good reading year for me. You know, books like Richard Power's Bewilderment didn't get in here. Um, Le Membrel's My Tender Matador was five stars, didn't get in here. Um, all sorts of books. The, what, the one down thing I will say is there are, you know, as with every year, there's always sort of new release books by some of my favourite authors. And this year, uh, none of them came anywhere close to making my top ten. So we had Civilizations by Laurent Binet, which was my biggest disappointment of the year. We had uh, Tokyo Redux, which is the long-awaited, after 10 years, final in David Peace's Tokyo trilogy. It was fine, it was solid, um, but nothing special. We had um, uh, The Address Book by Neil Bartlett, which is short stories, which I always struggle with, uh, which is, again, very solid, uh, but didn't, didn't blow me away. Neil Bartlett never really lets me down. In fact, one of the non-fiction books I read was a reread of his Who Was That Man, which I hadn't read for 30 years and is still 
you know, absolute five star read. Um, there was another. There was another author. Uh, oh yes, uh, Tom McCarthy's *The Making of Incarnation*. Again, you know, it's good, but it, it, you know, I expect these authors because they're in my pantheon to to blow me away, and none of them did, which which I think was the only disappointment on the year. So there you have it, BookTube. Thank you very much. Uh, let's get a discussion going on any of these books. Uh, Till next time.